It's really the biggest talking point right now in evangelical circles. Should Christians attend and support transgender weddings? It's a big question, and we need to think through it carefully, standing firmly upon Scripture. Welcome to Grace and Truth. My name is Owen Strand. I will be your host. Please subscribe to this podcast on all platforms. I'm not going to make this particular episode of Grace and Truth very contextual, because in reality, Although there has been a lot of discussion in recent days among conservative evangelicals about so-called transgender transgender wedding ceremonies, uh, this is going to be a question for the church beyond just January 2024. This is going to be evergreen, I think, for coming years. Christians are in a pretty wild age. We have heard for many years that we are in a secular context. Uh, where there's basically not a strong vision of God in the public square and in our culture. But in reality, we are equally in a pagan context. And that has particular relevance to sexuality and sexual ethics. The people around us increasingly, and to a very real degree right now, are not Christians in how they think about sex and how they think about manhood, womanhood, the family, marriage, and so on. They are in good number especially in more urban areas, pagans. I don't mean this in terms of a burn down term to, to hate them. I mean, it is a technical term in terms of how they think about the human person and human sexuality. They're pagan. They're, they don't have a Christian sexual ethic. They basically think that you can do whatever you want with whomever you want, provided, I guess, there is consent. That's really the only line left morally and ethically in our culture that obtains, at least among a lot of people like we're talking about. So we're in an age when we are marching into the teeth of the culture and we feel great wind on our face as Christians in holding to biblical sexual ethics, a biblical vision of the family, biblical manhood, biblical womanhood, so on and so forth. These are not easy days. And I want you to hear at the outset, and I don't mean this to discourage you, but it is likely going to get wilder out here, not calmer. This is probably just the early stages of the thunderstorm that we are walking into as believers in the West. I have no idea, in reality, what God is going to do in our day and age. I have no idea what God is going to do in America. I don't know what God is going to do in the West, and I don't know what God is going to do in the world. I worship an awesome God. God is the focus of my sexual ethics, of my engagement of manhood, womanhood, the family, marriage, and so on, not sin. Not any person, not what any system out there says. I get into all of that. I engage all of that. I try to as best I can. But fundamentally, God is the center of my thinking and my living in all of these areas. So I put my trust in a great God. I know that I am a speck of dust in this great cosmos. I know that I am not in charge. I know that I am not uh, able to predict what is going to happen. Uh, in in my own house, <laughs> ten minutes from now, I'm frequently surprised. Let that be said. Let alone in my state, in my country, and in this world. But if trends do continue, I think it's going to get wilder out here, not calmer. That means that, <clears throat> irrespective of any one discussion, right now Christians have a very good opportunity to think about how we engage wedding ceremonies that are not biblically based, that do not conform to God's design, that are not holy and blessed by Scripture. We know, by the way, that marriage isn't only for Christians. God has given marriage to humanity, and so we support even unbelievers getting married, and that means that we can attend a wedding of an unbeliever, a wedding of a man and a woman. That's according to God's design, even though there is not Christian faith. I'm not saying there are never circumstances that would make that uh, a matter of, of deeper thought. And I'm not saying we would never choose uh, to, to not attend a given wedding ceremony. There are a variety of man-woman wedding ceremonies that we might have moral qualms with. We might not attend. So let that be said, too. But that's not what I'm talking about here on this episode of Grace and Truth. I am talking about a man marrying a transgender man or some such arrangement. So I'm calling that a transgender wedding ceremony. Now, uh, what I want to do in what remains is give you 10 truths to shape how you as a Christian, how we as believers, I believe, standing on scripture as best I can, 
should engage these kind of wedding ceremonies going forward. All of this applies, of course, to homosexual weddings, so-called gay marriage, uh, thruples, uh, man-beast pairings, unions, anything else you can imagine. All of what I'm about to say applies much more broadly. And so I'm praying for this particular episode. I mean, I, I hope this podcast is used in ways beyond what I can ask, think, or believe uh, regularly, but I'm praying for this particular episode, that this will be a real resource beyond just right now, the little tempest we find ourselves in today. And, and I pray that this will be used to help Christians, not just now, but going forward. First, truth of 10 about transgender weddings, as I'm calling them, blanket term. Number one, the Bible does not enfranchise transgender identity. There's, there's no biblical basis for somebody claiming they are transgender. If I were to sharpen the point, there's no such thing as transgenderism. It doesn't exist. There are men and women made by God. You see that in Genesis 2, 7, uh, verses 21 and 22, and 24 and 25. You see God's design for marriage right there in Genesis chapter 2. It's lined out and laid out as clear as crystal. Now, in a post-Eden world, there is a lot of sin that we all battle, and we uh, sin in terms of our nature, and so we are corrupted in our humanity, and people will indeed feel like they are trapped in the wrong body. That is a real experience. It owes to numerous factors in a fallen world. We have real compassion for those who experience that. That condition is called by secular psychologists gender dysphoria. When people are experiencing that as Christians, we engage them with God's truth, with God's grace, with a listening ear, and with a, a desire and much prayer to help them walk through that faithfully and out of such feelings, or at the very least, as much as they can to resist those feelings and not give in to them. Okay, so the Bible doesn't enfranchise, give any basis for transgenderism. People feel like they are trapped in the wrong body, but they are not trapped in the wrong body. There is a condition that is a disorder of sexual definition. It's called different things. It's sometimes called intersex in the broader secular world. There are children who are born with uh, the uh, genitalia of both men and women. And at that, uh, in such a situation, a doctor works at the chromosomal level to determine whether there is an XX chromosome or an XY chromosome and the child should be raised accordingly. That's a broader discussion. There are children who are born then in a condition that results from fallenness, but even there at the DNA level, uh, God has enabled us to lead into clarity for such individuals who, again, have not asked for such a condition, uh, in many cases don't want such a condition, and, and we treat such people with real compassion and love and mercy and care. And that is very much in the mix of all of this. In speaking clearly and convictionally, as I'm trying to do by the work of God in me, I am in no way leaving behind uh, grace, mercy, and love. I am bringing it all the way in with me as much as I can into a tough discussion like this one. Second, the Bible speaks clearly to attempts to blur the lines of your God-given sex. The Bible speaks clearly to people, for example, who want to cross-dress, who want to present themselves in the clothing, uh, the presentation of the opposite sex. For example, in the Old Covenant law, in Deuteronomy 22, 5, you have the Lord God, you have Yahweh forbidding a man to wear a woman's cloak or vice versa. That is sin. That is abomination, in fact, according to the language of Deuteronomy 22, 5. And so the Bible isn't confused about, air quotes, transgenderism. That's a new term. But this is an ancient reality. It's not a new reality. And God's word speaks clearly to it. In the New Covenant, in a passage like 1 Corinthians 11, 3 and following, you have the Apostle Paul talking about hair length. And in a pagan Corinth, the Apostle Paul wants the Christian church to image the goodness of manhood and womanhood, even down to the details of such a matter as hair length. Paul says that a woman's long hair is given to her uh, as a covering, and a woman's long hair in 1 Corinthians 11 is her glory. So long hair is not glory for a man. It's not fitting. Paul says that nature itself teaches that a man having long hair is not fitting. Of course, there's discussion about 
the, the length that a man can have. We can have that discussion. It's a good discussion. There are gray areas, of course, in the Christian faith. And yet the Bible speaks clearly. It's not good to blur the lines of your God-given sex. It's good to be a man when you're a man. It's good to be a woman when you're a woman. It's not just right. You better be that. You better do that. No, it's good. God loves it. God is honored. God is glorified when, for example, we train our sons to be manly and we train our girls to be womanly. That's not outmoded. That's not silly. You shouldn't sneer at that or laugh at that. That's not a, uh, you know, an artifact of a bygone age. That's how Christians should raise their children to understand it's, it's good to be whatever God has made them to be. That's for their joy and God's glory. Third truth about transgender weddings. Marriage is defined in Eden and reaffirmed by Jesus. Marriage is defined in Eden and reaffirmed by Jesus. In uh, Genesis 2, as I've already mentioned, you have the Lord making the man and then making the woman from the man and then uniting them in a glorious garden ceremony, the first wedding ceremony there is. What is it? It is one man and one woman united for life. It is one man and one woman naked and not ashamed. So there's no shame in God honoring sex. There is so much shame in evil uh, visions of the body and sexuality, but there is no shame in what God has made. We have to protect it. We have to be careful about it in terms of how we train our kids and talk to them about such things, of course, but God's vision for marriage is a beautiful, good, joy-giving vision. It's defined in Eden. It's one man, one woman in covenantal union for life. That's the design of God. There are circumstances that work against that in a post-fall world, and we can have a conversation about that. I personally uh, have room in my theology based on what the scripture teaches for appropriate divorce and appropriate remarriage. Um, but nonetheless, uh, setting aside that conversation, marriage is designed by God. And Jesus reaffirms this design in Matthew 19, 3 to 6, uh, where he talks about how God made one man and one woman and uh, blessed them in marriage. And so Jesus in the new covenant um, affirms all God's design. And we, we go even further than this. Marriage is a picture of the gospel. The apostle Paul teaches. So in Ephesians 5, 22 to 33, the apostle Paul teaches us that our marriage relationship with the husband as the head and the wife submitting to the husband and the husband loving his wife tenderly and understandingly and the wife submitting to her husband joyfully in all things uh, that are moral, that vision is a living picture of the gospel. So um, at the end of all things, Jesus is going to marry his people. Uh, Jesus, uh, the husband and his, his church, the bride. Uh, we'll talk more about it the, that at the end. But even the design of eschatology, even the, the story of history is headed in a complementarian direction, in a man-woman direction that is symbolically in a marriage ceremony that will be uh, brought to completion in the new Jerusalem. What a glorious reality that is. That means then, as Jim Hamilton, uh, the biblical scholar has, has said very well, that means that the whole Bible has a, a strong affirmation of one man, one woman, covenantal marriage. And we cannot give that up. This is this is not the vision that I happen to like. This is not the vision that a lot of conservative evangelicals prefer. This is the biblical design. There is, by the way, polygamy that occurs in the Old Testament. Notice that there is no biblical endorsement of polygamy. Notice that there is no New Testament encouragement in, uh, unto polygamy. That is to be understood as uh, a kind of concession, uh, God allowing polygamy in evil times. Uh, because of the sin of his people and God in ways that push our categories using even polygamous unions, uh, for example, to have the 12 tribes of Israel produced. Um, and so we can have a broader discussion about polygamy. But from the beginning, marriage is one man, one woman that is reaffirmed by Jesus. And you see that even in terms of the broader sweep of the gospel story, redemption history. Fourth, Attending a wedding ceremony is commonly and rightly viewed as affirming it. So we need to understand this. If you attend a wedding ceremony, that's viewed as being there in love or support or appreciation of the couple in question. We're probably going to have to say in 2024 and beyond, 
the uh, partakers in question because things are getting wild out there. Attending a wedding ceremony then is affirming the union. I, I don't know of any other way uh, to understand uh, attending a wedding ceremony other than that. And that is, for example, why uh, you and I, I think the line is very clear here still, uh, would never attend, for example, a pedophilic wedding. Um, let's even say a wedding where uh, a man is marrying a boy and the boy has clearly consented to this. Would you attend that? Would you attend that in order to love uh, the, the husband and the person the husband is marrying? Well, I think it's pretty clear. I have to like be very careful in what I say because things seem so muddled and so unclear, even in Christian pulpits today that we have trusted for decades. But I think that uh, in the church, there is um, still a very widespread belief that attending a kind of man-boy union, so to speak, a ceremony that is no ceremony at all, would be seen as wrong, and so you shouldn't attend that ceremony. Or if a man was marrying a beast, an animal, I don't think anyone would say, hey, we should really love him because he's marrying, you know, a pig. So let's just, we don't agree with it, but let's show up and support him as he marries Porky. I don't think anybody would do that. I don't think anybody is yet making that argument. I anticipate there will be books and articles published in favor of such a perspective in days ahead. And nonetheless, uh, there are clear lines that we would draw about some wedding ceremonies. And that is because we innately understand, even if we don't have some long technical theological argument, that uh, attending a wedding is supporting a wedding, is affirming it. Fifth, fifth truth. Christians, therefore, should not attend, air quotes, transgender wedding ceremonies. Christians should not attend them. Because in reality, such a ceremony is not a wedding at all. There's no wedding happening. There's no marriage happening. I'm saying in truth, there are all sorts of lies that people are operating on all around us. People are living literally in lies. Part of what it means to be a Christian, if you're watching this or listening to this, is in love reaching out to people who are trapped in lies and seeking by the grace of God to bring them out of lies. There is no sense in which a Christian is ever called in scripture to support someone embracing lies. We are not told in any sense to make people's lives more pleasant by endorsing or affirming the lies they live in. Can we always challenge every uh, fellow sinner on every matter in which they're succumbing to sin? No, no, we can't. We know from lots of different family situations or friend situations that you oftentimes may be able to say about this much of the truth, a very little portion of the truth that you would love to say to that person. And sometimes you do try to be a loving gospel witness standing on the word of God and it gets shut down. I've had that, had that experience with with friends and family, myself. I, I understand that. So I'm not saying that we are called at all times uh, to have a megaphone and go around and read out everyone's sins that they're living in. That's not really the way we can function in this life. Nonetheless, though, I stubbornly repeat the point in love, Ephesians 4.15. It is unloving to affirm the lie someone lives under. Or we could put it differently, positively. It is loving to try to unmask a lie that someone is believing. This is the witness of the gospel. I think we're getting very confused and very murky in our thinking. I'm sure from good intentions out there in the church. I, I'm not saying that people out there who would disagree with the case I am making, for example, or even have publicly advocated such a case in recent days, I'm not saying uh, they have a terrible heart and uh, there's no uh, good intention behind what they're doing. I'm not even saying um, that they aren't trying to be thoughtful in biblical terms and work through different texts and these sorts of things. I, I'm not out here to burn down everyone. Uh, who's who's on the opposite side of, of what I'm standing for. Furthermore, if somebody is believing the opposite case that I'm making here, 
I very much want to be heard as saying, we all stumble in many ways, James 3, 2. Um, you're, you're drawn to drift just as I am from the truth. We all have to watch our life and doctrine closely, 1 Timothy 4, 16. We all are going to get things wrong. We all have to live a daily walk of repentance and confession and faith and claiming afresh the forgiveness of God in Christ. We did not only get forgiven once when we became a Christian. That is the moment when our Christian walk began. That's the watershed, absolutely. But the whole of the Christian life, as Martin Luther said, is a life of repentance. That's that's front and center in his 95 Theses, which we talk a lot about, but nobody reads. The whole of the Christian life is a life of repentance. Repentance isn't just the doorway to the Christian life. And then you shut the door. Hey, guys, we're the people who never have to repent again. They repented. No. When you walk through the door, that becomes your habitual practice as God is working in your heart, softening your heart, thawing your heart, leading you through the Holy Spirit and the witness of the church and others to see your sin. And so you, you live a life of confession and repentance. So if somebody out there has wandered here, if, if somebody listening to this or watching this has attended uh, a so-called gay wedding or supported one or, or a transgender wedding or whatever you want to call it, I'm not standing here, or I guess sitting here technically, and saying you've committed the unpardonable sin. Even if somebody has advocated from a pulpit that you can go to uh, a transgender wedding ceremony, I'm not saying you have committed the unpardonable sin. I don't think you have truthfully. But with all of that stated, the stakes here are high and we have to lead people out of lies into the truth. That is fundamentally what gospel witness is. We think of it as having somebody, you know, profess faith, but, but think of it from this angle. This is one angle uh, that applies to gospel witness. You're saying to a person, whatever lies you are believing, whatever stronghold you are living captive to, let me take in, in great affection a mallet and smash that stronghold for you so that you would then go on to see the majesty and goodness of the Christ who was crucified and resurrected for a sinner like you and me. Leave behind those lies. Don't live in them. Don't walk in them. Don't believe them. They will probably come back to you and Satan will try to tempt you with them and Satan will try to get you to live under them afresh. Even if you do walk away from them, you turn from them in repentance and faith in the name of Jesus Christ. But I, as a Christian, I say to you, resist them afresh every time. Pray for power over them. Repent where, where you do entertain them in a serious, real way, even for a flash, even for a second. Repent of that. Confess that to God and leave that behind. Lies are not your friend. Jesus is your friend. The Christian faith is not a pleasing fiction. The Christian faith is a faith that is grounded in the truth. It's not mostly truth, but some lies. It's all truth. We are not perfect adherents of the truth, but we are called with everything we have in us by the Spirit's power to live by the truth and not by lies. Sixth, Christians should love people identifying as transgender, in air quotes, every way they can without affirming their identity, without affirming their sin. Christians should love people of all sorts of sin patterns without in any way affirming their sins or their sin patterns. Here again, love is being subtly redefined in Christian circles, including by people who have good intentions, who may be trying genuinely to be a gospel light in a darkened world. And yet, love never lives by lies. We must genuinely seek to reach out to people who are uh, caught in sin patterns of all sorts of types, but we never affirm their sin. Jesus reached out to sinners of lots of different backgrounds. Jesus never affirmed their sin. The apostles reached out to all sorts of people, Jews and Gentiles alike, all over the Greco-Roman world. They never affirmed their sin. They did the opposite. Jesus, the apostles, and beyond scripture, faithful men and women in church history. This is 
what it means to be a Christian at the most basic level. You love fellow sinners. You're no better than them. You don't walk six inches above the ground and, and they don't. You love them, but you don't affirm their sin. Just like if you're sane, you don't want anyone affirming your sin. Now, this is an instinct we all have, <laughs> and it's sinful. We, we want sympathy in our sin. We want to excuse our sin, and we want other people to uh, pat us on the back. M maybe we don't, uh, you know, blunt the morality of our sin, the immorality, that is, but maybe we just um, go around to people and we don't really deal with our sin, but we just make our life out to be so hard that all we get is sympathy and no conviction. There's lots of ways um, that we can we can do this badly, and we all tend toward them in our own styles. The point is this. We're not doing something different with people outside the church that we need to do with ourselves. We have to not affirm our sin, and we have to not affirm their sin, and we have to instead stand on the truth with ourselves and with them and call ourselves to the truth and call them to the truth. We're not doing something in terms of the public square different than we should be doing in our own home. So we want to be known as a loving people, but it is profoundly unloving to affirm someone's sin. If I have a bad temper and someone close to me, a godly person, sees that I have a bad temper, is it loving for them to say, oh, well, you have a bad temper, but hey, you don't need to repent to that. You don't need to confess that. You just, oh, your sleep is bad. You and, and, and plus in your past, you had some tough circumstances. You had tough relationships. And by the way, this is me speaking, I may have. Those may have had an effect on me. And I may need real compassion for that and real healing and biblical counseling for that at different levels. But I don't need somebody fundamentally to come to me and say, let me affirm your bad temper. No, this is just, again, common sense. This is just basic biblical sanity. I need someone to come to me and say, um, okay, let's talk through this. Why do you react this way? Let me understand. We talk it through. Okay, I understand that, you know, you, you had this, these instincts toward anger. You tend to overreact and you tend to freak out. And so you're not trusting God in that moment and you've got to grow in that. I need somebody to work with me through that. I also need somebody at some point to look me in the eye and go, and bro, you got to kill this bad temper. I'm not here to affirm this. I'm here to call you as a fellow sinner in love, in the power of Christ, to die to your sin. Die to it. Which means, Colossians 3, kill it, repent of it, confess it to God, turn from it, ask God for power over it, and ask God to work in you so that when those old patterns arise, the patterns of the old man, you confess them and then you choose new patterns. You've got a moment where your temper spikes, but you calm down. You ask God to forgive you that bad temper and help you to calm down and speak calmly and tenderly and affectionately, whatever it calls for. We don't need somebody affirming any of our sins. We need somebody who lovingly, patiently, wisely calls us out of them. Seventh, this approach is just gospel witness in action. This is gospel witness in action. We, we want to, to be in people's lives as much as we can be. This is not easy. But we want to be in their lives. We want to know unbelievers. We want to reach out to them. We want to show kindness to them. But we're always seeking to proclaim Christ to them. So we're not choosing between actionable love and gospel witness. The two should work together as much as we can get them to work together. Eighth, we see then this kind of summary point. We can't affirm a person's air quotes, transgender identity or practice in any way. Any way. This includes, by the way, gender pronouns, I believe. Um, we might want to be kind to a person of this sin type. And so we might think it is loving to use their terms and to play by their playbook and to live under their delusions. 
It is not loving. If you have an elderly relative, you go to their house, you want to be a gospel witness to them, and they think they are the king or queen of England, England, excuse me, and they insist you live as if they are the king or queen of England, and you are under their monarchical reign, you will no doubt try to be patient with them, but you will not affirm that they are the king or queen of England. And that's kind of a humorous delusion, but the point stands. I've, I've already surfaced it. We can't affirm lies. And so we can't affirm transgender identity or practice. And by the way, we as fathers can't stand to the side while this kind of identity and practice is mainstreamed in society and in culture. I'm thinking, for example, of sporting events. If you are a father, hear me, please, standing on the word of God. If you are a father and there are kids who are trying to compete against your child, in sporting contests, for example, especially where there could be contact sports or something like this, I would strongly encourage you to speak up about this and to stand against it, not making your salvation dependent on this. But we have too many quiet men out there. Men have to lead in this struggle. Men have to stand up and be counted. Men have to pray to God for courage and then act in courage for the glory of God. We need an army of men. They may not be fancy men. They may not have a lot to say, but we need an army of men who stand up and are counted in the cause of truth. Don't watch World War II movies about courage and then miss your shift in the here and now. Take your shift. Show up. There's a conflict right now. It's not against Nazi Germany. It's a war of lies, lies all around us. And we've got to be men of truth, and we've got to be men of Christ. Ninth, collating all the preceding. We can't positively engage a wedding ceremony of this type at all. We can't positively engage this kind of ceremony at all. We are called uh, not to endorse sin, but to warn fellow sinners. So it's not just that, in other words, we, we, I don't think, biblically, putting these things together, biblically, the Bible doesn't technically say how to handle a transgender wedding, but the Bible does call us to be the, those who search scripture and put things together, uh, text upon text. I, I don't think we can even engage this event positively at all. You, so it's not just about not going to a ceremony. You, you see an Instagram uh, glossy picture of a couple I don't think you should endorse this. I'm quite certain you shouldn't. You shouldn't affirm this. You may feel like you are in some kind of fundamentalist chair and you're a terrible person and you're going to be seen as not loving. Who cares how you are seen by men? You want to have a, a good reputation among unbelievers in terms of your moral character, but your faithfulness is not defined by unbelievers. Optics are not what drives your Christian faith. The world watching you is not your primary concern. You want to be holy. You want to be kind. You want to be loving. Absolutely. God watching you is your primary concern. That is the day in and day out, minute by minute burden of your heart and your life. God is watching you. <clears throat> God is hearing you. God is seeing everything. God is missing nothing. That should motivate you every day way, way, way more than a watching world. Tenth and finally, all this leads to a conclusion. There's just one ceremony we must attend. The marriage supper of the Lamb. That's the one ceremony you can't miss. You don't want to miss. And we won't miss by the grace of God in Christ. We read about this in Revelation 19. I'll pick up in verse 9. And the angel said to me, John, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Hey, Christian, there's a lot of interesting decisions that confront you in this world. There are hard questions and gray areas. Absolutely, there are. But I believe a sound interpretation of Scripture and collation of scripture 
uh, through the whole Bible, through the whole canon, leads you squarely to one conclusion. You cannot support ungodly ceremonies of any kind. You cannot give approval to them. Marriage is God's. God has defined marriage. God has therefore defined weddings and wedding ceremonies. In fact, God has shown us in the book of Revelation that there is a coming wedding ceremony when Jesus takes his people to himself in the new heavens and the new earth. And we live forever with God in eternal glory and joy, beauty and love. Christian, that is the day to live for. That is the day that matters. This right now is where things are being determined. This right now is where your faith is being tested. This right now is where your walk with God is being proved. So pray to pass your test. It's not that your salvation is dependent on these kind of matters that we have talked about, but faithful Christians need to walk faithfully with their God according to the faithful power at work in them. You and I need to, to speak the truth. You and I need to live according to the truth. And you and I need to live for the last day. We need to know that God is seeing everything. And what matters is not ultimately what men think of us. This is like an epidemic in the church today. People are terrified of bad optics. People are terrified of bad press. Strive to honor God and love your fellow man. Strive to have good character by the power of God's grace, but live for the last day and make sure you don't miss one wedding ceremony, the marriage supper of the Lamb at the end of all time. God bless you.